Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus today. I am Trace, and this is episode one of four on drinking water. Make sure you subscribe so you get all the episodes in this series. Make sure you check us out over on SoundCloud and iTunes, where we've squished all of these episodes together into one big, awesome episode. And if you've never tuned in to DNews Plus before, hello, welcome. This is a show where we take a big topic and we break it down so we all understand it a bit better. And today we're going to talk about when drinking water became a thing and what kind of technologies we used to get it to us in the first place and what is actually in drinking water. Hint, fluoride is in there, of course. And we're going to talk about water defluoridation later in this series with a friend of the show from the Blum Center, a special guest. Don't worry, we'll get there. We're also going to talk about whether we're going to run out of drinking water in the future and so much other stuff. So over the next few episodes, we're going to break this all down. We're going to all understand drinking water a lot better, something we probably take for granted. And first, when did we start making drinking water? Let's kick into it. Today, most of the people who are listening to this podcast or watching this on YouTube probably have the ability to get drinking water fairly easily. You can just turn the tap on. One could argue that a potable water supply is the most important municipal service, but this has not always been the case, obviously. I mean, water can carry a lot of pathogens. It can be very dirty. It cannot help you at all if it's done wrong. For most of us in the West, we probably don't really think about drinking water. So we wanted to know when was the first time we took water from the environment and gave it to people in, say, cities or towns? When did we start harvesting water? For most of human history, the rivers were the highways of humanity. You know, we didn't have an I-75, we didn't have an I-5, we didn't have Route 66, you know. We had rivers, and those rivers stretched way out into the frontier, but they also went all the way down to the ocean, right? Those rivers and streams were the highways of history. So most cities, if you think about it, are based around where a river was. But that wasn't the only reason. It wasn't just because of transportation. Fresh water was needed for a populace. We learned that in Roanoke, Virginia. Look it up if you don't know that much about it. And also in Jamestown, Virginia. Uh, when we started colonizing this new world, we found all of these freshwater sources. You can trace the evolution of public water supply systems to the growth of larger populations throughout history. But when the populations began to get too large, that's when we needed to adapt and figure out a new way to get water, because you couldn't just get it out of the river. Surface water just wasn't enough anymore. So we started digging to get more water. Hello, distribution lines. Some of the earliest water distribution systems came from Persia. Around 700 BCE, they began constructing elaborate tunnel systems called kanats. And it's hard to say exactly how old they are since most of the evidence for the age of kanats is circumstantial, but they're basically hand-dug tunnels which extract and transport groundwater. Now again, 700 BCE, that's a long time ago. They could run for miles, and every so often along the length of the tunnel there would be a vertical shaft where they could filter the water to allow for ventilation and repairs and all sorts of other things. It sounds a lot like a modern-day sewer because that's essentially what it is, but instead it was for drinking water. The tunnels had a gentle slope down from mountainous areas, and they would have an outlet at a village, though it didn't have to necessarily be nearby since these things stretched for miles. If the water was going to be used for irrigation, they could have canals that would distribute that toward fields, but humans have been using these for centuries, and some of these are still in use today in Iran and Afghanistan. Until 1933, Tehran's entire water supply came from a system of canats, which is so crazy. You also probably thought of, if you are a person of uh, American history persuasion, aqueducts, because we learn a lot about the Romans, even though we don't learn that much about the Persians. That's kind of strange if you think about it. You had to know that these were coming at some point when it comes to water, because the aqueducts of the Roman Empire are extremely famous in the West. The Europeans love to talk about themselves. Etymology time, baby. Aqueduct comes from what else? Of Latin, of course. Aqua means water. Do care, maybe, do ser, I'm not a Latin student, uh, to lead. So aqueduct, lead to water. This might be our last etymology break. Foreshadowing. One of the most famous water supply systems is the aqueducts of the Roman Empire. They were developed around 300 BCE, and these bad boys were an engineering feat, and they actually served the capital of the Roman Empire, its water supply, for 500 years. They were famous in photos as well, those archways that you can picture with like a trough on the top. But many of the aqueducts were actually underground. They were underground conduits made of stone and terracotta pipe, wood, leather, lead, bronze. 
A lot of them were also above ground because you had to crisscross valleys and things, and they would use gravity to get water to flow into urban areas. But the water wasn't actually stored. It was directed into fountains, like the Trevi Fountain in Rome was famously fed by aqueducts. One of the crazier ones was the Anionovis Aqueduct. It drew water from the Anian River in the Apennine Mountains. It was 87 miles long, and it took it into the heart of Rome. That aqueduct took 14 years to build, actually more than that. And according to geologist and microbiologist at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, Bruce Falk, this aqueduct was one of the main reasons the Roman population could grow to over a million, even though it was still the first century CE. You can see these arches in Greece, Italy, France, Spain, North Africa, and a bunch of other places, all left over from the aqueducts. They're amazing infrastructure improvements that the Romans were able to create. During the Middle Ages, many people reverted to getting their water from wells and local rivers. Yay, the Dark Ages. Water systems began to deteriorate. The water supply systems at this point weren't that great. And all of that changed, of course, post-Dark Ages in the Renaissance. <laughs> The Renaissance. Water systems began to be fit with pumps that used water wheels, and then with the invention of the steam engine and other technology to pull water from places, uh, especially deep underground, we sort of get to where we are today. Things haven't changed all that much. Beyond the actual getting of water, when did we learn to make some water drinkable? Like, how did we figure out before we knew what microbes were? Because, you know, germ theory didn't come about until the last couple hundred years. That's, it's pretty incredible that people would find water that they could drink thousands of years ago, right? Isn't that crazy? Early water treatment focused on making the water look and smell better. The smell especially I find super interesting because the nose and the mouth aren't necessarily for making you know, chocolate chip cookies more enticing. It's so that you can tell whether or not the food that you're ingesting is poisonous or bad for you. Most of the time, if you open your fridge and smell something and you're like, woo, that means it's not good. Most of the time. Sometimes it's Ludafix and you just gotta eat it anyway because apparently it's delicious. I've never had it. Tell me if you think it's delicious. I don't know. Methods to improve the taste and odor of water date back to 4000 BCE. According to ancient Sanskrit and Greek writings, some methods to purify water for drinking were filtering through charcoal, exposing to sunlight, boiling, and straining. Filtering through charcoal is crazy because that's essentially what we still do when you put water into a filter thing that you put in your fridge. That's just a charcoal filter. It's insane. This was 4000 BCE. The driving factor behind early water treatment was the water's turbidity. Turbidity is a measure of cloudiness or particulates in the water. If you can't see through the water, probably not safe to drink, right? Egyptians were known to use chemicals like alum to make the particles settle out of the water. And according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, alums are any group of hydrated double salts, usually consisting of stuff like aluminum sulfate or the sulfate of another element. So finally, once Canots and Roman aqueducts come onto the scene, remember uh, just before the turn of that BCE, you know, CE changeover, uh, they weren't providing the cleanest drinking water around, mostly because the water supply just wasn't the cleanest. When they sourced a really pristine supply, the problem of contaminated water was mainly solved, but not completely because you still had to treat water. Some of the earliest forms of water treatment were used in Europe. They had riverbank filtration, and instead of getting water directly out of the river, engineers would put a line of wells in the sand next to the river and then pump the wells. Essentially, they were using the sand of the riverbank to pull water through it. That way, they could filter out waterborne pathogens that made people sick. In Germany, along the Rhine, many cities were using similar technologies before the modern water treatment plant was developed. And again, a lot of this was done prior to germ theory. Around the turn of the 20th century, engineers at the Lawrence Experimental Station at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, aka MIT, developed a system called the slow sand filter, which could be used anywhere, not just next to a river. Basically, the slow sand filter allowed water to percolate through a bed of sand. A surprising amount of waterborne pathogens were then removed, just sand. But this was still really early in the game for drinking water. From that very basic method, we got where we are today. According to a professor at Duke University, the author of Drinking Water, A History, Kim Salzman, we now have three basic levels of water treatment. We've got primary, secondary, and tertiary. 
really unique names, Kim Salzman. The primary treatment is essentially a settling pond. You put the water in there and then to remove large solids like grit, oil, and grease, things separate by their specific densities. Things float to the top and to the bottom so they can skim them off or they can get it out of there without getting the gunk at the bottom of the pond. Then they send it on down to the secondary treatment. Secondary treatment is biological treatment. It's where biological degradation of organic compounds happens. Microorganisms and leftover solids settle out of the water. You can look down on them when you're flying, big circles, not the ones in fields. That's just water patterns, but the ones that are actual cement structures. Uh, then after you get past biological treatment, you get to tertiary treatment, which is very expensive. It's a lot less common. And this removes specific residual things. Uh, it has a lot of extra processes like filtration, chemical oxidation, ozonation, chlorination, and disinfectant processes. Now, you might have noticed that I said chlorination, which most of you will likely associate with swimming pools. Let me tell you a quick story. I'm an Eagle Scout. I was hiking in Philmont in New Mexico, and they have water there. And to make that water drinkable, because they have microbes in the water, and you're supposed to have low impact, so you literally put your water bottle into a river, and you pull it out, and then you can add iodine tablets. It does not make the water taste very good, but it doesn't hurt you. You can also chlorinate the water. One of our batches was double chlorinated. That was not so great. Really tasted bad. So chlorination is pretty common. We do it today, we've been doing it for a long time. According to professor and director of the Institute of Environmental Science and Engineering at UC Berkeley, named David Sedlak, there had been attempts in the 19th century to use chlorine as a way to purify or clean water, but it didn't really become commonplace until the first decade of the 20th century. Sometimes you can actually taste chlorine in your drinking water. Again, it's not gonna hurt you unless it's at super high concentrations. Just like anything with chemistry, it's all about dosage. But how does this chlorine affect your drinking water exactly? Find out tomorrow on D News Plus. Make sure you subscribe so you know what else is in your drinking water and you can find out all sorts of other awesome stuff. Plus we got that special guest coming up. We learned so much researching the topic this week, and we would love to learn more stuff. If you also love to learn more stuff, check out The Great Courses Plus. It's a video learning service. I'm obviously a big fan. With The Great Courses Plus, you can stream hundreds of lectures presented by award-winning professors, and you can do that anywhere, anytime. I recommend checking out Experiencing the Hubble, Understanding the Greatest Images of the Universe. Super cool. I love the Hubble. As a DNews Plus viewer, you can get a free month of unlimited access by signing up at The Great Courses Plus dot com slash dnews plus one more time the great courses plus dot com slash dnews plus there's also a link in the description and it supports the show thanks so much for tuning in this week i'm trace come find me on twitter at trace dominguez and we'll see you next time